When she entered service, Giuseppe Garibaldi was just one of many light cruisers in the Regia Marina. An exceptionally capable one, perhaps, but nothing special. This would be largely true for the entirety of her initial service under the Kingdom of Italy, an average cruiser serving average duties. However, when Italy transitioned to the modern Republic, Garibaldi would eventually see a refit unlike any other, continuing the fine Italian tradition of dramatic rebuilds into the nuclear age. What other light cruiser of her vintage and nationality could, after all, say they were refit to carry ballistic missiles? Before we get to that, though, I will go over her original guise and career, one that certainly gave no hints of where she would end up decades later. Laid down as the second of the Luigi di Savoia Duca degli Abruzzi class, hello, mouthful, Garibaldi was the final of the Condottieri line of light cruisers. Somewhat akin to the British town class, these were a series of related light cruiser designs. Where they do differ a bit is that there are sharp differences between the first two designs, where the Italians went all in on speed while lacking much in the way of protection, this to counter the large French destroyers. The second two designs, where armor protection, while still light, became much more important. And the final one, which we'll get into in a second. Because the Condottieri, while an interesting topic, are really something they need a deeper dive in their own video on. For here, suffice it to say that the Abruzzi class went another step above and beyond, having vastly improved armor protection, and swapping twin turrets for triples, gaining two extra 6-inch guns. Now, for Garibaldi in particular, laid down at the tail end of December 1933, she would be launched on April 21st, 1936. Her commissioning would follow on December 1st, 1937, at which point she would join the Italian fleet. Coming in at 11,735 tons fully loaded, Garibaldi is on the heavier side for a European light cruiser, reflective of her armor protection. This consisted of a 30mm, 1.2 inch, outer belt, with a further 100mm, 3.9 inch, inner belt behind it. This makes her armor protection equivalent in raw thickness numbers to that of the Zara class heavy cruisers, which are in their own right the most heavily protected of their type until you get into something like Des Moines. Though, as I'm sure has come up on other ships and topics, one can argue up and down to the ends of the earth about is it better to have a decapping plate like on these ships, or just plain old raw, thick armor. Regardless of where you fall on that argument, the protection Garibaldi boasted was vastly superior to her older cousins, and anything short of the last class of French-like cruisers, and still arguably better than them, though that does depend on your view of decapping plates. Her firepower continued this theme, as previously mentioned. Garibaldi commissioned with 10 152mm 6-inch guns, mounted in two super-firing pairs, with a twin turret mounted above a triple. This was supported by eight 100mm secondaries and a further eight 37mm anti-aircraft guns. Her weaponry was rounded out by machine guns, replaced by 20mm cannon later on, and two triple 21-inch torpedo tubes. All this armor and firepower was mounted on a hull that was 187 meters, 613 feet long, with a beam of 19 meters wide, okay, technically 18.9 meters, which is about 62 feet for non-metric users. Her speed was nothing to sneeze at either, managing 34 knots on two shafts and 100,000 horsepower. Though it must, as always, be noted that this is on sea trials, and even the Italians expected something more like 31 knots, which is still completely respectable, in actual service. With the details out of the way, though, what was Garibaldi's service history like? Unfortunately, at least for my videos, I had to disappoint on this one. Garibaldi doesn't have a particularly exciting service history, in spite of having served through the entirety of World War II. While I'll go over what she did do, the really interesting thing for her comes post-war. In her Second World War service, Garibaldi would only fire her guns in anger at British ships once. That was the Battle of Calabria, where, along with the Bruzzi, she fired the first rounds. 
While she didn't land any damaging hits, splinters from her shells did succeed in hitting HMS Neptune. This didn't do substantial damage beyond wrecking her catapult and scout aircraft. Following this, the two Italian sisters would withdraw back to the Italian battle line and do little else of note in the battle, though they did avoid any damage in return. After this, Garibaldi would spend the rest of 1940 on ineffectual convoy raiding attempts and the like. She was unlucky enough to be present at Toronto when the British attacked, but at the same time, lucky enough to avoid any damage in the attack. Similarly, come 1941, she was part of the fleet at the debacle of Cape Matapan, though again, she didn't do much while avoiding any damage in return. This is a running theme with Garibaldi, and her sister for that matter. They were the most modern and powerful light cruisers Italy had, so they were quite often held back from really dangerous duties, like transport runs or minesweeping. This was further emphasized once the Zara class was absolutely gutted at Cape Matapan. While not kept away from battle entirely, they certainly weren't thrown into the same duty as other cruisers. The only other event of note in her pre-armistice service was on July 28, 1941, when she was torpedoed by the submarine HMS Upholder. While taking in about 700 tons of water from this hit, Garibaldi would make Italian waters and be repaired and returned to service within two months. After Italy switched sides then, Garibaldi would continue to serve with the co-belligerent navy. Specifically, she would often operate in the South Atlantic as a deterrent to German surface raiders. When the end of the war rolled around, Abruzzi and Garibaldi were the most modern ships left to Italy with the Littorio class being consigned to the breakers. As a direct result, these two, admittedly well-built and powerful, light cruisers, would trade duties as the flagship of the Italian Navy. While I'll talk about Abruzzi in her own video, it's now time to get to the fun part of Garibaldi's history. Because up to 1953, she only received minor refits and modernization, detail changes to her anti-aircraft suite, and adding radars and the like. In 1953, though, she would be decommissioned and taken in for a typically Italian refit. A rebuild, really, akin to the earlier ones of the 1930s for the old battleships. Only where those ships had came out in the same role as they went in, yeah, they were rebuilt heavily, but they were still battleships when they came out, Garibaldi changed drastically. She lost every single one of her old main battery guns. The two forward turrets were replaced by new twin mounts, containing 135mm guns. These turrets were new, but the guns were contemporary with the cruiser's original construction. Her new 76mm anti-aircraft guns were actually new designed weapons, though. Were it just this, she would have been an interesting case of a light cruiser being refit with smaller caliber guns. But only her two bow turrets were replaced in such a way. Garibaldi's true refit was converting her to the first guided missile cruiser in Europe, she lost her two stern turrets, replacing them instead with a twin American design launcher for the Terrier missile. Still not exactly an interesting refit, other than in being a frontrunner to the guided missile cruisers classification. Built on the back of an old pre-war cruiser from the 1930s. No, what really makes Garibaldi special is the last part of her refit mentioned at the start of the video. Four launchers, mounted astern of the Terriers, for Polaris Ballistic Missiles. Yes, Garibaldi, a cruiser from the 1930s, remember, was refit to be capable of firing nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles. This is not, by any means, your standard kind of refit. Ballistic missiles on surface ships is kind of a rare thing to begin with. Doing it on such an old hole, by the Italians no less, is not exactly the kind of thing one expects. It's weird to think about, actually. An Italian light cruiser flinging around the same missiles you see on first generation ballistic missile submarines. As it would turn out though, she never received Polaris missiles. The Americans never let the Italian Navy have them. This was, in some ways, a blessing in disguise. It forced the Italians to, instead, develop an indigenous missile of roughly the same capabilities. This would eventually come about in the Alpha missile. The lessons learned from developing these missiles, even if they never saw widespread use in their original role, helped jumpstart both the Italian and greater European space programs. In a similar vein to other nations and their ballistic missile studies, the knowledge from Alpha still sees some legacy in modern European space agency launchers. 
Garibaldi herself, though, with the Italian nuclear program kneecapped by financial issues and later non-proliferation treaties, well, she spent the rest of her service with some useless deadweight launchers, though still a pretty capable first-generation guided missile cruiser in all other aspects. She was the flagship of the Italian Navy for much of the 1960s, only exiting service for good in 1971 after 34 years of service. She would be scrapped soon thereafter. In the end, Garibaldi is a fun case, a ship that was deliberately held back from the exciting service history, but one that still served for a long and fruitful career nonetheless. A classically Italian rebuild followed, both in how extensive it was, and how questionable it was in the long run. The Polaris launchers were an interesting technological feat on such a hull, but one can hardly deny they might have gotten better use out of just about anything else in that space. If not for the fact that, completely unintentionally, this rebuild helped jumpstart European space exploration. I doubt that anyone involved with Garibaldi, either her original builders, her crew, or those who came up with her rebuild, could have expected that, of all things, to be her legacy. Thank you for watching. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content, and I'll see you in the next one.